Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. You may be seated. Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down, that the mountains might quake at your presence. As when fire kindles brushwood and the fire causes water to boil, to make your name known to your adversaries and that the nations might tremble at your presence. This was the prophet Isaiah's prayer some 2,800 years ago. And it remains our prayer today. We pray that God would rend the heavens and come down and put an end to the evil in this world once and for all. When I visit people, a common theme I hear is sadness and frustration with the problems of this world. The television news programs are filled with one story of violence after the next. Everything from another drug-related death or a gang shooting to a terrorist attack somewhere around the world to the threat of nuclear war with North Korea. We all make comments, myself included, about how terrible this world is has become. For example, earlier this week I was visiting with a dear member of our congregation, a World War II veteran, who saw unimaginable death and violence as he fought to liberate Europe from Nazi Germany. And as we talked, we wondered how people could do such terrible things to each other. My friends, the answer quite simply is sin the sin that dwells inside each one of us. Human beings are not basically good, as many today would have us to believe, with just a few shortcomings that we can overcome with enough money and the proper education. Rather, as we confess each Sunday, we are by nature sinful and unclean. As Isaiah says in today's reading, we have all become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like a polluted garment. Evil lurks inside us. And so we are all capable of terrible, wicked things. It's just one example, and I know this is a sensitive topic, but we have to ask, why is abortion on demand for example, even in the final months of pregnancy, still legal in our country. No one can deny that a human life is taken by abortion. That's the whole point of the procedure. Defended under the premise of giving women the freedom of choice, the freedom to decide whether they want to have a baby or not. Reproductive rights, it is called. I ask you, though, if our society sanctions and approves of the murder of the smallest and most innocent among us, for that's what elective abortion is, then why should we be surprised by the stories of violence and mass shootings that nightly fill the television news programs? For by our laws and actions, we've taught ourselves and our children that life is disposable when it becomes inconvenient for us. We see this attitude also playing out now with the increasing support for euthanasia and assisted suicide. For example, if the care for the elderly and the disabled becomes too burdensome and expensive, some are now arguing that it's morally okay to kill them. My friends, as our society drifts further and further away from God into this culture of death, I'm afraid that the death and violence in our world will only increase. An estimated 50 to 80 million people, both military and civilian, are estimated to have been killed in World War II. If that horrific death toll wasn't enough to get people to stop killing each other, then sadly nothing in this world will. That's why the people of God, 
from the time of the prophets such as Isaiah down through the centuries today to today have prayed that God would come down and end the awful evil and violence that we see around us and worse that lurks within us. We daily pray Isaiah's prayer, Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down, O Lord. And in his mercy, the Lord graciously hears and answers our prayer. Although we deserve nothing from God but wrath and punishment for our sins, Isaiah reminds us that God remains our loving Heavenly Father. He writes at the end of our reading, But now, O Lord, you are our Father, we are the clay, and you are our potter. We are all the work of your hand. Be not so terribly angry, O Lord, and remember not iniquity forever. Behold, please look, we are all your people. Yes, God, our Heavenly Father, looked at the misery and suffering of his people and came down to us in the person of his Son, Jesus Christ. God the Father sent his Son, Jesus, into our world to save us from our sins and from the evil and wickedness that surrounds us and that is even in us. Jesus came down from heaven to do battle against the forces of sin, death, and Satan. And so for those who belong to Jesus by faith, God remembers our sins no more and promises to take us one day from this evil world to himself in heaven. It's this first coming of Jesus at Christmas that the church is preparing to celebrate. With the arrival of the season of Advent, our church is now beautifully decorated in anticipation of this joyous celebration. Up front on the side, there's the lovely nativity scene of Mary and Joseph and the baby Jesus asleep on the hay. I think everybody loves Christmas. In fact, I don't know anybody that doesn't. With the beautiful decorations, the happy Christmas carols, the delicious Christmas cookies, and the overall feeling of joy and goodwill this time of year, the Christmas season is a time when we try to escape from the problems of this world, at least for a little while. For a few weeks in December, our thoughts turn toward the incredible good news that a Savior has been born for us, one who will free us from all ills in this world and the next. But my friends, as we celebrate Jesus' birth, we must also remember what it meant for Jesus to be our Savior. We recall that the cute baby Jesus asleep on the hay would himself one day become a victim of the hate and violence that fills our world. We remember that Jesus was born for one purpose, that is, to die. The eternal Son of God took on human flesh and became man so that he could die in our place to pay for our sins. That's why the traditional gospel reading for the first Sunday in Advent is the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. At first, it seems kind of out of place. But my friends, we prepare to celebrate Jesus' birth by first remembering his death. The reason why Christmas is of any lasting significance and importance for us after all the pretty Christmas decorations are put away is because the baby Jesus would grow up and one day enter Jerusalem as a man to hang on the cross of Calvary for our salvation. On that first Christmas night, the angels told the shepherds, Unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And 33 years later, Jesus would enter Jerusalem on Palm Sunday to fulfill that promise. Jesus, the Savior, would die on the cross to save his people from their sins. Because of Jesus' sacrifice, all sins, even the sin of murder and abortion, have been paid for by the blood of his cross 
My friends, Jesus remembers your iniquity no more because your sins have been removed from you by Jesus as far as the east is from the west, Scripture says. Your sins were washed from you in your baptism by which you were joined to the death and resurrection of Jesus. You now stand holy, clean, and righteous before God through faith in him. And what's more, your crucified and risen Savior continues to come to you today in the preaching and hearing of his word to give you the fruits of his cross namely forgiveness of sins, life, and salvation. And and in just a few minutes, he will come to you once again in this, his holy supper, to give you his very body and blood to eat and to drink as a pledge and guarantee that of the inheritance that is awaiting you in heaven as a child of the heavenly Father. Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down, O Lord, God's people pray. And in answer to your prayer, the Lord Jesus has come down to save you. Some 2,000 years ago, he opened the heavens and came down when he was born for you at Christmas to be your Savior. Having then ascended into heaven after his death and resurrection, Jesus continues to open the heavens and come down to you today in his precious word and sacraments by which he forgives your sins and gives you the gifts of heaven. And according to his promise, he will open the heavens and come down one more time on the last day when he returns to judge the living and the dead. As God's people, we look forward with eager anticipation to that great day. For on that day when Jesus returns, what we now desperately hope and yearn and pray for will be ours forever. The evil and wickedness of this world will be destroyed. Man will no longer harm his fellow man. War will cease. There will be no more murder or violence. Peace on earth won't just be a wishful slogan written on our Christmas cards. It will be an eternal reality. The new creation that Jesus is preparing for us will be like Christmas year-round, one in which you'll never have to put the Christmas decorations away. For in that blessed place we will gather with the saints and angels and singing our carols and praises to our Savior King. And what's more, in heaven we won't have to settle for looking at a ceramic figure of Jesus lying in our nativity scene as beautiful as it is. Rather in heaven we will see Jesus the real flesh and blood Jesus, face to face. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts in Christ Jesus. Amen.